Good afternoon and welcome back. I will call the uh, subcommittee to order. And I uh, will now recognize uh, uh, any other member who wishes to offer an am amendment. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, have an amendment at the desk. The Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Strike section Mr. 1. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to consider the amendment as read. Uh, so moved. Uh, the gentleman from Utah is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I, I offer an amendment today that deals with the, uh, the uh, six day to five day delivery. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we need to understand, I believe, that uh, the Postal Service is a, is a tool of commerce. And it, in such that approach necessitates that we look at not only the business model, but we look about how we're going to drive not only uh, increasing revenues or stabilizing, in this case, stabilizing revenues for the Postal Service, but also cutting costs. And I, I deeply appreciate, uh, I think, the bipartisan approach to uh, making sure the Postal Service is as effective and as efficient as we can possibly be. The, I think the uh, unions have actually done a fairly decent job along the way to work with the management to uh, downsize where it has been necessary. Some would argue that we probably need to go deeper and further. Uh, and those discussions, I know, will be ongoing. And again, while I do not want to minimize or, or diminish the, the discussion about the need to become more efficient and more effective, we need to also become realistic in that we have a high fixed cost at the Postal Service. When 80 percent of your expense is in labor, that is a fixed expense that is rather high. Now, the Postal Service has capacity. The problem is we're not filling that capacity. We're not maximizing that capacity along the way. And so from a business model, when you have high fixed costs and you have a capacity and volume that is not being fulfilled, the last thing you want to do is just cut services and raise rates. That's not going to drive volume. I think one of the challenges for the Postal Service moving into 2012 and beyond is how does the Postal Service become more relevant without stepping on the toes of those in the private sector. There are a unique set of circumstances and services that can be offered only by the Postal Service. And I want to see that continue to be expand. So I offer an amendment here that gives some flexibility to the Postal Service and yet does not diminish the service that they would offer to all Americans. Because long gone are the days that grandma's just writing the kids. That's not what drives the volume of the Postal Service. It's a commerce tool. So in my district, I have, for instance, eBay and, and some of the financial services organizations who really do depend upon their ability to get uh, services or goods to the consumers in a timely and efficient way. And so this amendment that I offer here today, Mr. Chairman, says we're going to give some flexibility to the Postal Service to allocate up to 12 additional, I call them postal holidays, 12 days in a calendar year that maybe nobody's going to quite miss the mail on that particular day. But I think to suggest that we're just going to simply eliminate Saturday services uh, across the board, we're going to eliminate 52 days, that ain't smart business. Are you going to really eliminate the Saturday delivery before Mother's Day? Are we really going to get rid of that Saturday delivery before Valentine's Day that might fall on a Sunday or Monday? Are we really going to get rid of that Saturday delivery right before Christmas? No, that's not good business. That's not smart. And so what we want to do is give maximum flexibility to the Postal Service. And what I'm suggesting here with my amendment is to say, maybe we should try this with 12 days. Now, I'm actually going to withdraw this amendment at this time. I, I've got some assurances from my leadership and, and, and Chairman uh, Issa. I appreciate working with him and Chairman and Ross and, and others. And I want to work in a bipartisan way with my friend, Mr. Lynch and Conley and others to try to find a way that uh, maybe is a little bit more palatable. But I just uh, Would the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. Uh, I want to assure you that uh, your idea of finding an interim solution and ultimately making sure that the priority of the post office is on savings with service, uh, this is an intriguing idea. I know that we have talked about some ideas that will be in your uh, perfecting amendment uh, at the full committee, and I look forward to working with you and supporting that amendment at the full committee. And I, and I thank the gentleman for his uh, help in this process. I, I, I appreciate it. Yielding back my time, uh, reclaiming my time, I, I appreciate that. And I think that the, I want to work with all those involved. Um, but let's also remember it is incumbent upon us to enable and really demand of the Postal Service that we 
look at the relevancy of the Postal Service. It is a great business tool. It is a competitive advantage for the United States of America. There can be more that we can do with this, and we need to explore all different types of options. One other one that, I, Chairman, I will mention real quick in closing here is the cross-functionality with other portions of the Federal Government. If you look at what FEMA is doing to try to recreate what uh, they have to do in terms of mapping and delivering of uh, medicines if there was some natural disaster, if you look at what the Census did, they had to go out and recreate all this thing and go hire hundreds of thousands of people. We already had a Postal Service in place. So we need to look at the cross-functionality as well. Uh, but at this time, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the uh, indulgence of looking here at my amendment. I'm going to withdraw it at this time, and before, then we'll come back with an, an adjusted amendment to, at the full committee be, level. Before we uh, recognize the withdrawal of the amendment, anybody else wish to speak on it? Mr. Lynch? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, just have one quick comment, and that is uh, about the percentage of, of the Postal Service's uh, cost going to, to, to labor. Uh, you know, it's pretty basic. Uh, the Postal Service picks up the mail, they sort the mail, they deliver the mail. It should not be surprising to anyone that this is a very labor-intensive operation. That, that's why so much of, you know, if, if we could find out a different way other than, you know, people going out and carrying sacks of mail and putting it in people's mailboxes, we could probably reduce the amount of labor that's committed to this, this operation. But so, so I'm, not, I'm not shocked or surprised that uh, 80 percent of labor is, is uh, of the, you know, the cost is going to labor. But thank you. Uh, is, is the would, would, the general, would the gentleman yield to me? Yeah, I yield to uh, the gentleman from Virginia. And I don't mean to cut off Mr. Chaffetz. If I could just ask Mr. Chaffetz a question and then I would be glad to yield to him to address whatever it was he was going to bring up with Mr. Lynch. But I would ask my colleague, my colleague from Utah, um, said earlier in this markup, he did not support going from six to five days a week. You repeated it. Now, there is an amendment about to be voted on that would take care of that problem very simply. Not 12 days, not 13, not 14. It says, let's go back to six, because of exactly the arguments the gentleman from Utah gave, which is we are giving up a competitive advantage when we do that. And I would add to your list of woes, you know, people on any Saturday who are worried about getting their pharmaceuticals via the mail, especially in rural areas, such as the, my friend from Utah represents. So I would urge my friend, uh, whatever discussions he's had with his leadership, to try to work something out. There is an amendment in front of us. I would urge him, given what he said, he doesn't support going from 6 to 5. There is an amendment that takes care of that issue very simply, and I would urge him to, uh, to vote for it. And I now yield to the gentleman from Utah, because I know we want to talk about Mr. Lynch as well. And, uh, and we will look at that amendment. I am trying to give some flexibility. I do think there are some times, uh, perhaps in August or June or July, that probably aren't necessarily going to miss it. Is not necessarily even going to be on a Saturday? It could be potentially on something else. And so, again, I want to further the discussion. I think conceptually people understand where I, where I am. Um, I want to focus in large part on getting to the relevancy. Uh, I would also just suggest to, to my friend, Mr. Mr. Lynch, that it is a competitive world out there, and that's a good thing. And that at least the numbers that we need to look at with FedEx and UPS and others, their labor costs are significantly less. There is also a layer of bureaucracy and uh, management that need, we need to continue to look at. It isn't necessarily that person who is working their, working their tail off to get the mail delivered in the middle of a snowstorm. Uh, sometimes there is a bureaucracy and a level of middle management or upper management that is impeding the ability to. So, again, they do a great work. It is still amazing to me. We put a stamp on a letter and it gets to the other end of uh, the country in a relatively short amount of time. And, and I appreciate the good hard work that they are doing. But we, uh, we have to be responsible. Reclaiming my time, and, um, I, I yield back to Mr. Lynch. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Without uh, objection, then, show the amendment from the, by the gentleman from Utah withdrawn. Are there other amendments? Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk that uh, I don't know if it was numbered, but it strikes Section 111 of the bill. Uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Strike Section 311. 311. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amendment to the amendment to the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois, strike section 311 of the bill. If the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
And I want to thank you for the opportunity to present this amendment to repeal Section 311. As an original sponsor, co-sponsor of the Postal Enhancement and Accountability Act of 2006, which was just five years ago, and as a former postal employee, I am personally committed to doing all that I can to create a dependable, robust, and efficient postal service. However, there are many key elements in this bill that create an unfairness doctrine in diminishing the work of protections that I feel are necessary in a 21st century work environment. Section 311 simply is an unnecessary reform of the Federal Employee Compensation Act, specifically targeting postal employees and crippling worker protections. And if the concern is in reforming FECA, we should look at the entire Federal workforce and not just postal employees. And so one would have to wonder and ask the question, why are postal workers singled out? Having served as a postal worker, I personally know of how labor-intensive it is to move and deliver mail to every citizen in the country. Regardless of inclement weather conditions, postal sorters, handlers, and processors, and letter carriers deliver mail six days a week. The postal workers deserve the same workers' compensation protections granted other Federal workers. We all hold a responsibility to ensure injured and disabled workers in the line of duty are compensated for their service with a fair compensation plan and not the threat of a reduction in payments. Section 311 does the opposite, and I encourage us to repeal it. I think that basic protection and fairness in the workplace is what makes our country the country that it is. It makes our productivity what it is. And I would think that it would certainly make good policy to repeal Section 311 and give the postal workers the same treatment as all other Federal employees and all other private employees. And so I would urge passage and yield back, Mr. Chairman. Does anyone wish to speak on the amendment? Please. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I rise in support of uh, the gentleman from Illinois' uh, uh, amendment. Uh, I want to repeat, or at least re reiterate my uh, reservations on a point of order on this section being included in the bill. I think the parliamentarian has ruled that it is not in order before this committee. It is in the jurisdiction of uh, others. But I think that uh, uh, Mr. Davis's motion to strike would certainly uh, uh, correct that defect. He does correctly uh, raise the issue of treating two sets of employees differently for performing the same, basically the same work. Uh, I think that uh, the Department of Labor has already expressed concerns about being able to effectively and efficiently operate separate workers' compensation systems with varying benefit levels and, and medical treatments for, for different uh, sets of employees. I also think there are better ways for us to uh, ad address the issue of uh, workers staying too long on, on uh, workers' comp and, and, and resisting retirement. But, however, this is a, a labor-intensive job that they are engaged in. And, uh, again, uh, again, I repeat my objections to this uh, section being included in the bill as it is in w within uh, the jurisdiction of another committee, two other committees, uh, Ways and Means and uh, 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 the Labor Committee as well. But I thank the Chairman for yielding me this time. I yield back. 
Thank you. I will recognize myself to strike the last word. Uh, one of the issues, of course, that with regard to solvency here at the Post Office is their ability to make their uh, workers' compensation payment of a little over $2 billion, uh, which they are not going to be able to do. And one of the things that this subcommittee has had an opportunity to do, along with the fine work of uh, Chairman Wahlberg and his subcommittee, is to, to, to look at ways to reform the Federal Workers' Compensation Program. Under uh, the FECA program, compensation benefits are paid as, at, at a rate as high as 75 percent of the salary, tax-free, for as long as the work-related injury continues or until death. The average Federal employee retiring on an immediate annuity under CSRS will receive about 60 percent of his or her three-year high average salary, and most of which is taxable, compared to tax-free FECA benefits of up to 75 percent of the salary. Uh, unfortunately, the FECA plan has become a retirement plan for thousands of postal employees because the payout is better than what their retire ben retirement benefits would be. Today, of, uh, of the more than 100, uh, 15,000 postal employees receiving uh, FECA payments, 8,600 are age 85 and older, including more than 2,000 ages 70 and older and 132 ages 90 and older, and the oldest are 98 years old. Uh, therefore, I would uh, request defeat of this amendment. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. yes. I think this is such a you have said it so well, it is so obvious that the other committee who could have acted on this as part of their broad jurisdiction for Federal employees did not. Now, I have spoken since the, uh, the last uh, part of this markup with the Chairman. His intention is to do it, but right now he is sitting with a GAO study. I believe the place marker of the jurisdiction of this committee saying in no uncertain terms this cannot be kicked down the road forever is important. I am going to speak to the GAO and try to get that six-week prediction of the number uh, that this reflects that they asked for. The study moved up. As we already determined, it is w fully within our jurisdiction. We have an absolute right to do what we are doing, just as they had an absolute right to do broad change in FECA that would have affected postal employees. Therefore, I am going to side with the Chairman on defeating this amendment, because this is a problem that needs to be fixed. As I said earlier, though, I look forward to working with the committee, the other committee of jurisdiction, because if they can act in a timely fashion, we would be happy to have them do a separate bill. But I think as the Committee of Exclusive Jurisdiction of the Post Office, to not talk about what the Chairman just talked about and make it clear that you cannot have people 85 years old, 98 years old in a couple of cases simply receiving tax-free payment instead of being dealt with in a proper fashion and then put it on the back of the ratepayers. So, Chairman, I applaud you for your statement. It was absolutely right. I am voting with you. The time may come when another committee picks up a bill that would take care of this, but right now all we can really do is move this to the full committee, work with the GAO to get a study. I am perfectly willing to pull this out. It is not a big amount of savings. But at the same time, Mr. Chairman, I think we have to leave it in to make it clear that this is a problem that needs to be fixed, that in fact the 50 or $100 million a year is money that the ratepayers should not be paying, and it should be resolved to the benefit both of the disabled and, in fact, the ratepayer. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I strongly support it and thank you for yielding the time. Mr. Yield back. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, I, just briefly, um, I appreciate uh, the words of, of, of Chairman Issa, but the fact that we may feel strongly about something uh, is, not the, is not to be construed as asserting jurisdiction over that issue. And when we have an, apparently an opinion from the House parliamentarian that this falls beyond our jurisdiction, uh, you know, if we are going to start to uh, uh, legislate on areas that don't fall within our legislative jurisdiction, where does that end? There are weapon systems we may like or not like. Let us uh, let's mark up a bill on that, irrespective of the feelings of the Armed Services Committee or their, or their schedule. Um, I don't know. Well, we can get into uh, the Judiciary Committee and the Financial Services Committee's jurisdictions while we're at it, because they've been too slow by our standard in marking up their respective legislation, and therefore we're simply going to assert universal jurisdiction. I think when we do that, it taints our own process, and I think we should tread lightly uh, when we try to do that. And uh, I'm going to support the amendment for lots of reasons, uh, but I think Mr. Lynch has a point with respect to 
cautioning us about proceeding on this particular section when we have already received uh, an opinion from the House parliamentarian. I would yield to Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of points. One is uh, it is just a small matter, but uh, I believe uh, we may have recited the fact that the Post Office did not make this $2 billion payment. I believe I got a letter yesterday or the day before that they had indeed made the payment. So I, I, had, I wasn't aware. I was okay. Aware I, I know that I was, was the case. Of that. That's why I didn't. That's yeah. So, so I just want to forgive them for that. Uh, they They've made it. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, it is wonderful. Uh, the, the, the other point is that, you know, I, I'm just not sure from a parliamentary standpoint if, if we improperly consider matters that are not in order in this committee, uh, what, what does, when, when we report this bill out, whether favorably or unfavorably, what, what impact does that have when this committee reports out a bill that has not been considered under the rules and, and has been out of, ruled out of order by the parliamentarian? Would, would the I'm just opening. Would the gentleman yield? Oh, yeah, I would. I would. Uh, we have jurisdiction over the post office and the personnel. Ultimately, we, we have exclusive jurisdiction over the post office, but less than full exclusive jurisdiction over Federal employees. That creates a shared jurisdiction. There is, in fact, an ability for the Ed and, work, Ed and Labor to act. There is an ability for us to act. The parliamentarian will make a decision at the point that this is reported to the floor on whether or not, one, a point of order there, two, a sequential referral. At this point, this committee has a response. We had a placeholder in the original bill. That placeholder was pretty easy to see. It did not trigger a sequential referral. At the end of the day, I want Ed and, Ed and Labor to look at this. But quite frankly, what they have done is they have asked for GAO to do a study. We are going to move that study up because we believe we can from six weeks to two weeks, which I believe will give us some real understanding. It is my preference that if Ed and Labor can take up this independently, we are happy to. But we cannot tolerate the post office paying for a failed system just because it is not fixed. And I would remind the gentleman, and I appreciate your yielding, we have the ability to take the, the uh, postal workers right out of this system. So we have the ability to take them out of a system, and yet you would have us not try to do something to reform it. That is one of the reasons that we are taking it up. We can and will, if we need to, take the postal workers right out of the system if it means that that allows the postmaster to ultimately eventually get the savings by not having people in limbo at a cost of $100 million a year. Um, I believe his time has uh, expired, but I will um, um, Yeah. Uh, well, look, I, all I know is what the rules are. And the rules say that, that that section of Title V is in the exclusive jurisdiction of the uh, Labor Committee. And that as the parliamentarian has correctly ruled, it is not correctly before this, this committee. That is all I am saying. Well, the, and if you are having the all this debate and wasting a lot of yeah. time on, on, a, on, a, on, a, you know, on a motion to report out of committee a bill that has not been properly considered, well, that is not really smart. And I appreciate that the gentleman is saying the other committee may be punted uh, you know, rather than address the issue and referred to for a study, and that takes time. And I, look, I, I, I agree. I agree. You know, sometimes that's very frustrating, but these are the rules that that they've given us. And uh, as the gentleman from Virginia said, you know, some like some things I'd like to do in the appropriations, uh, you know, end of things. If we could do those on this committee, that would be a great thing too. But uh, we just uh, are prevented from doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm, I'm not a punter. Uh, in fact, I wasn't on the football team. I was a wrestler. And we're willing to wrestle with issues. Um, the, the fact of the matter is on Ed and Workforce uh, Committee and on uh, the Committee on Workforce uh, Protection uh, that I chair, uh, it was our sincere efforts that it would be bipartisan. It would be an issue that we would work through together in the entire Federal workforce, which takes in the Postal uh, Service as well. It was not an attempt to pump, but it was an attempt to work with uh, both Chairman Klein, uh, Ranking uh, Member Miller, and on my subcommittee, Ranking Member Woolsey, uh, to, if we could, with full facts and figures in front of us, come up with a solution that did take in the entire Federal workforce and do it in a 
proactive, productive way. I am delighted to hear uh, our chairman, uh, Mr. Isa, uh, come alongside of us to assist us, and I think maybe with uh, his efforts, uh, GAO, which we expect to do a credible job, uh, will move from six weeks to two weeks. Uh, and that would mean that before the end of our efforts on the full committee that this bill will go to, we will have some concrete solutions in place and, in fact, may put it back in front of the uh, Ed and Workforce Subcommittee on Workforce Protections to do the job that we need to do, not punt, create what is necessary to go alongside of what this committee is doing in assuring our, our citizens that we have a productive, working, um, viable postal service to go forward, and we deal with the issue of FECA as well. So on the basis of that, I, uh, I will stand with uh, my chairman. Uh, that is generally a good thing to do. But in this case, I agree uh, with the provisions that have been made that that is an effort we want to move forward on. Okay. Will the gentleman yield? I will. Yeah. I, I would draw the uh, pejorative term punt. I am sorry that I <laughs> referred, to, referred to you in that, that fashion. I didn't know you were here. Uh, 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 would the gentleman uh, yield? <laughs> I reclaim my time. Um, does that make a difference if I'm here or not? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm kidding. I'm I yield. Kidding. I, I, I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Are there anyone anyone further to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, uh, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Davis. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Aye. Davis. I ask for a recorded vote. Uh, a recorded vote on the amendment offered by Mr. David will be postponed pursuant to the committee rules. Are there other amendments? Chairman. Mr. Davis, are you I recognized? Another amendment. Uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois, strike, sec strike section 403 of the bill. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my amendment is to strike Section 403 of H.R. 2309. Section 403 will phase out postage rates that facilitate the ability of nonprofit organizations, churches, and other faith based institutions to effectively do charitable work in America in helping the poorest and the neediest people. Given this tight economy and high unemployment, nonprofit organizations and faith based institutions are called upon to do more to ease the burden of our citizens who are afflicted with diseases, mental and physical disabilities, disaster, drug addictions, reentry, homelessness, and poverty. How can these organizations who provide so much assistance to others? be called upon yet to share again a high-cost burden that tax their efforts. This is just not fair, nor the right thing to do, let alone to think about it. We must be cognizant of how Section 403 rate preferences for nonprofit advertising of H.R. 2309 will impact our nonprofit and faith-based organizations who receive charitable contributions from the average citizen to help others. For example, this provision would cost the March of Dimes Foundation an additional $1 million in postage expenses in the first of the year, in the first year of implementation. As a result, the Foundation would have to drastically cut mail volumes across the board, which in turn would mean dramatic loss in donor support. As you may know, the March of Dimes Direct Mail Programs is the second largest source of funding within the organization, which provides life-saving research efforts for women, infants, and children. Last year, the American Lung Association mailed about 40 million pieces of mail that cost approximately $6.3 million in postage. Section 403 would equate to a rate increase for the American Lung Association by 35 percent. According to the Lung Association, 
this imposed rate hike would significantly cut back their mail volume and significantly reduce their no donations to fund research projects to improve treatments and find cures for more than 37 million Americans. There are many more examples of how Section 403 can hinder the efforts of many nonprofit and faith-based institutions from helping people through charitable donations. And so I reiterate the importance for not supporting the provision Section 403 of H.R. 2309. The Congress established nonprofit rates in 1951. Those preferred nonprofit rates have been reauthorized by Congresses and various presidents until this day, 60 years later. The reason is simple. Nonprofit organizations provide needed support and services for the American people, programs that government cannot provide. During these difficult times, nonprofits are being called upon to provide even more support for a growing number of Americans. The mail remains a vital means for nonprofits to communicate and raise precious contributions needed to continue their missions. It is illogical and unfair to eliminate nonprofit postage rates, resulting in massive postage rate increases. It would cripple nonprofits and sharply reduce their ability to benefit American society. At this time, when so many Americans are suffering, I would urge that we not further penalize their ability to get help by increasing the rates for nonprofit mailers. I would urge support of this amendment and yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, any other members desire to speak on this issue? I recognize Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for yielding the time. While I largely agree that the Postal Service should work to ensure that mailing products cover their full costs, uh, I do recognize uh, Mr. Davis's point that the specific challenges uh, increased postage costs may have on nonprofit mailers, uh, given the present state of our economy and the current financial challenges that some Americans are facing. It's, it's plain that nonprofits play an even more important role nowadays, and I think that uh, uh, Mr. Davis's amendment reflects that. Additionally, we have heard from a number of nonprofit groups on this particular section of the Chairman's bill. One entity is, in particular is the American Lung Association, and they have written to me saying that, quote, the increased costs of this provision would also have a devastating impact on our ability to deliver our mission programs, including funding research to improve treatments and find cures for the more than 37 million Americans with chronic lung disease. Educating people with uh, lung disease and their families about how to manage their disease and fighting for cleaner, healthier air to breathe. Nonprofit postage rates enable the American Lung Association and other nonprofit organizations to provide a critical role in our society, to play a critical role in our society and achieve our charitable missions. Phasing out the reduced postage rates hurts nonprofit organizations, the public, and the Postal Service. So, therefore, we respectfully request that this provision in the Postal Reform Act be removed from the bill. I will leave it at that. To that end, I urge we adopt Representative Davis's amendment, and I yield back the balance. Would, would the gentleman yield? I will yield to the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. just want to add my voice to that of Mr. Lynch and, of course, Mr. Davis. Um, perhaps this is, again, in the category of unintended consequences. But part of the fallout from adoption of this bill could very well be to uh, inflict serious injury to a number of large nonprofits who are heavily dependent on direct mail uh, for raising revenue, for communicating with, uh, with their donors and their supporters. Uh, it falls in the same category, you know, in terms of, un I will be charitable, unintended consequences, the loss of, huge loss of America, rural areas in terms of coverage due to this bill uh, and, of course, the loss of a lot of labor rights due to this bill, uh, the loss of a lot of home delivery, direct home delivery, uh, you will have to go and pick up your mail instead due to this bill. So this falls in the category of, I think, 
uh, intended and unintended consequences, but injurious nonetheless. I intend to support the gentleman's amendment and yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I will recognize myself to strike the last word. Under the uh, Postal Reform Act, this um, provision would reduce the discount, uh, now given a 40 percent to nonprofits. Um, annually, uh, by uh, over six years, uh, down to 10 percent, reducing it by 5 percent per year. Um, the reason that this is on the table is because uh, everything with regard to uh, the, the, the cash flow, the solvency, the expenses, and the revenues of the, of the Postal Service are on the table. Right now, we are looking at uh, those being, that, that, that can afford it to pay their full freight in terms of the Postal Service. Um, I believe that between this committee, between the full committee, and between the time we get on the floor, that we will see a strong uh, negotiation of bipartisan cooperation on resolving this issue of um, the nonprofits. Uh, this is a very difficult thing. Believe me, I, I, I understand um, uh, the, 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 the significance uh, of this. Uh, but it is my desire to keep this on the table. Uh, through the full committee so that we have an opportunity to hopefully reach some agreement that will uh, accommodate those nonprofits that are highly dependent upon uh, the, the mail service for communication of their services and for their funding. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, I, too, am in support of your position. I might want to add just two things. When we talk about nonprofits, let's remember that we touch equally the political mail the Republican National Committee, the Democratic National Committee, the State Committees, all of whom effectively are subsidized. But having said that, the 40 percent to 10 percent, which certainly we can have a dialogue about, if you take $10 billion in cost out of postal operations through efficiencies, the actual amount that would be raised is not a 40 percent increase in the rate. It is not a 30 percent increase. It may be a de minimis increase. So one of the points that I hope we all look at between now and the full committee is if we achieve the efficiencies we know we have to, what would be the net increase and would it be affordable? And I think that is an important one. We don't want people having to go somewhere far away to get their delivery. We want their deliver delivery to be substantially to the home. And I think we can do that, but do it for a lot less money, and that does drive down the, the, the cost. The last thing, which is hard to score, and, Mr. Connolly, you may not know this from the processing centers, but the interesting thing that I have been told repeatedly is when you have excess labor, what they do is they kind of say, you go sort stuff. And what are they sorting? They are sorting to a great extent this very mail. So the, the inefficiency is greater in non-first class classic delivery. And that is part of what we are trying to achieve in this, is to make sure we right-size the workforce for each of them. So I, I, I stand with the Chairman. I know he is right on this issue. At the same time, I know he cares about not hurting the nonprofits. Uh, I am not sure where he stands on not hurting the RNC and the DNC. That is a separate subsidy that I am not sure the American people are as sympathetic about. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I, Mr. You. Chairman, if you would allow me just a light moment, I would say to my friend from California, if we could just cut in half which of those political entities are affected, this <laughs> I might support the provision. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman has yielded back. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Davis. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the Chair, the noes have it. Mr. Davis. A recorder vote has been requested. A recorder vote on the amendment offered by Mr. Davis will be postponed pursuant to the committee rules. Are there any other amendments? Mr. Mr. Lynch? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. I believe it is designated amendment number 29. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, originally, this, this amendment, uh, the operative uh, language in this amendment struck uh, Titles 1, 2, and 3 of the underlying bill. However, after our discussion uh, regarding the overpayment due to the Post Office regarding the FERS overpayment, which is about $7 billion, and the discussion about 
uh, a possible way to work that out so that we might use part of that money to sponsor a, a early retirement program, since that is the post office's money, and uh, it would uh, it would achieve the objective of reducing the size of the postal service by offering uh, a, an early retirement incentive. What I've done here is rather than strike sections one, two, and three, I've simply uh, redrafted this to put this language regarding the FERS overpayment at the end of the bill. So everything in the bill would remain as is, except uh, the language here would, would uh, direct that the, the overpayment of the FERS obligation by the post office uh, be used for the purpose of uh, sponsoring an early retirement system for those employees who are already eligible for, for re full retirement. So that's basically what would happen here. And uh, I'll, I'll – Would you yield? I sure will. So, uh, your, your amendment then would take whatever amount is in FERS that may be deemed to be an overpayment and put it towards early – incentivizing early retirement. That's well, it would give – it would uh, – That is correct. It, it would provide voluntary separation incentive payment as established under Section 3523 for eligible employees, those that are uh, qualified to retire, and uh, providing voluntary separation in incentive payments as established under 3523 in conjunction with voluntary early retirement authority for el eligible employees. It is already, uh, you know, part of, uh, part of Title V, I believe. Yeah, Title V. One more question, would you yield? Sure. What if there is not a surplus? No, this, this, is, this is the part that has already been agreed, uh, that the basic calculations of FERS has been established that there is an — And I, and I guess my, my, my question goes to that. The, that calculation is from 2009, and I'm assuming that, that, that it shows that there is still a surplus if there was a surplus. I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that where are we if, if we have an up-to-date calculation? Well, it would require a calculation of the surplus. And the amount, nothing, if there is zero surplus, there is nothing to, to fund an incentive. So it just says that the amount of those surplus postal contributions shall be used by the United States Postal Service for the purpose of, as I said before, a voluntary separate, separation incentive payment as is as already established under Section 3523 of, of Title V, and B, providing voluntary separation incentives as established under Section 3523 in conjunction with a voluntary early retirement authority for eligible employees. So those two groups are those that are uh, eligible for retirement and those who are almost eligible for retirement. I think those are the two groups that are defined uh, in those sections of Title V. Are there any members which wish to speak? And I will recognize myself to strike the last word. Uh, my concern with the amendment. Uh, is the fluid nature of, of FERS, uh, that, that it is dependent on, on market uh, actuarial studies, market uh, returns, and what may be deemed to be an overpayment at one point may deem to be an underpayment depending on market conditions. And so that is what wh where I believe, and I have to give a, a great deal of credit to my ranking member here who, who I think he and I agree that if we can incentivize um, the, those that are eligible for retirement, actual retirement, then I think we have done a great service not only to them but also to reduce, helping the Post Office reduce their workforce. My concern is that the mechanism by which we are doing this is not necessarily an agreement that there is a surplus or that there will be a surplus later on. There are several agencies that may show a surplus in the, into their retirement system but yet may not be and vice versa. So this is subject to market fluctuations over time, which is why actuarially at any given time that is not actually what is the, the funded or unfunded liability of a retirement system. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, I will yield. But, but it, only, it only deals with a surplus. So if there is zero surplus, there is nothing to hand out. You are not at risk. And, and I, I understand that. I, I, I think there is also a more crea creative way to approach incentivizing, and that is through probably one of the, collateral, the collateralized loan option that we put into the, um, uh, in, into the substitute, which I think gives some more capital available to the Postal Service to do that. Now, this oh, I, I know it doesn't go comport with what you are offering. 
Well, no. Look, there's an over there's an overpayment of of uh, federal employee retirement system contributions. Okay, so those can't be used for for you know other uh, you know non non retirement purposes. What we're saying is they're going to be reimbursed for their over for their overpayment, but that those those that surplus will still be used for retirement purposes. However, it will be a retirement uh, of of a retirement incentive for employees who are otherwise qualified to retire, or those who are almost uh, eligible. So that will be an early retirement for those individual employees. This is the postal service's money. This is this is that's why it's a, it's a you know it, it's a surplus. It's it's over what they were normally required to contribute. And so we're restoring it to them, and we're directing them to lower their workforce, which is the object of what I believe the the, the gentleman's bill uh, directs. We're, we're trying to meet the goals of the legislation, but instead of using taxpayer money as as the underlying bill would require, it would require us to borrow. Ten billion dollars in taxpayer money to give to the post office. I don't want to do that. So what I'm suggesting is use the postal service's money to to fund these early retirements or or uh, retirement incentives for eligible employees. That's that's the object of of this amendment, and it I, I purposely uh, left intact. The remainder of the bill that uh, that the uh, the sponsor, uh, Mr. Issa, was defending earlier, with the hope that the discussion that we had earlier about addressing this issue, the FERS overpayment, and the idea of using that, uh, I think it was seven billion dollars, was the estimate. I'm not I'm not sure if that's still the the, the number we're dealing with. It's it's the 2009 number, I believe. Uh, we use that money, Postal Service's money, to, to pay for this early retirement. I think I'm starting to um, repeat myself, but that's, uh, that's my position. Thank you. And reclaiming my time, uh, I, I, I agree with you that we ought to look at the incentivizing of retirement for those who are eligible for retirement. Uh, my concern about using the FERS uh, contribution right now is, is that the only calculation is as current as of 2009, and we need to see where we are, because as pension funds go, they fluctuate over time. And I don't believe it's prudent to use it at this time to do that, although I think that as time goes on, we might be close to being on the same page with regard to how we fund that. Let me, yes, uh, let me try this again. Okay. <laughs> this this uh, early retirement incentive would be a fixed, would be a very fixed period in payment. It's not, it's not meant to go on like, uh, you know, f for for the life of the recipient. This is an incentive, I, I, likely to operate only in two years, probably the current year and the next year. There would be a certain amount of money put aside from the surplus. So you're not extending any obligation before, beyond what you have. Now, it may be seven billion, it may be five billion, but what we're saying is whatever is physically there that is owed to the post office, direct them to use that for an incentive program for retirement for some of these hundred and twenty thousand employees that they want to move off their payroll. We would not be obligated beyond what we agreed what what Democrats and Republicans agreed to obligate for that purpose. So there is no unfunded liability. It is contained. Uh, it's contained within the the amount as defined as a surplus uh, of, of contributions by the United States Postal Service to the federal employee retirement system. I, I hope I'm. I hope I'm making myself clear. I'm sorry. And and, and I understand. The, the, how, your, your position. My position, to fundamentally and as simply state it, is to say, uh, what if there is no surplus? Uh, did, did we have a surplus today? Did we have a surplus in 2009? Do we still have one today? 
and, and if we use these funds that we allege are surplus, where are we going to be five years from now if it is now an unfunded, and do we have to come back and go higher for prefunding? I, I, that is my concern, is that, that while I laud the efforts to provide the funding for an early retirement, my concern is that the source of those funds might have unintended consequences down the, the, the line if it creates an unfunded liability for, for, for pensions, and it also does not take into account where we are as of 2011, only as of 20, 2009. Let, let me uh, one more time. Look, uh, <laughs> the, the, obligations, uh, the obligations that we are asking the Postal Service to, 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 to make here is with its own money. They have contributed too much money in excess of what they were obligated to do under the terms of the Federal Employee Retirement System. They have money coming back, okay? And, and that is that's as of a date certain and, and of a specific amount certain that they will have due back to them. What we are trying to do is to, to direct them to use that excess for the purpose of lowering their payroll. You can't go wrong here. We are we're, we're, we're directing the post office to use their own money in this fashion, and we have got a little bit of leverage with them right now. Let's, let's face that. Uh, and so uh, I, I know you are saying, well, we don't know what is going to happen on down the road. Right. We don't know what is happening down the road. But we do know right now is that they have overpaid by some number of billions of dollars, and that's that is real money that is owed to the post office. And they are going to get that money, and either we let them pay, uh, use that money for what they will, uh, or we direct them to use it in a way that reduces their payroll, which is what we're, I, I think we were concerned about at the beginning of this hearing. That is it. I yield back. Any further member wishing to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the Chair, the noes have it. I request a roll call vote. A roll call vote has been requested. A recorded vote on the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch will be postponed pursuant to committee rules. Are there other amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It is uh, amendment number 90. Six, I think. Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia at the end of Chapter 37 of Title 39, United States Code, as contained in Section 407A1 of the bill, add the following. Section 3707, Postal Service Program for certain other non postal services. Without objection, you waive the reading. Mr. Uh, uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here is an amendment I know will bring both sides together uh, with respect to the Postal Service. Uh, one of my great uh, concerns about the future of the Postal Service, Mr. Chairman, is that irrespective of the particulars, we have got to create a new business model for the future. The, the current model doesn't work and isn't going to work carrying us forward. Uh, we may disagree about how that is going to happen or what the constituent elements of that new model are. But one of the things I think we have to do is free up the Postal Service to experiment and, and to look for commercial opportunities, not in competition with the private sector, but in partnership with the private sector, as postal services all around the world do now. There are many European models that are successful. I mean, I'll give you a small example. If my local government would like to cohabitate in the post office with the Postal Service because it's easier for constituents, Let's let them do it and pay rent doing it. If the DMV would like to cohabitate with the uh, Postal Service uh, so that people can have a one-stop shop for a local government paying taxes, getting their license renewed, and you know, uh, picking up their mail or dropping off their mail, why not let them do it? If Starbucks wants to open up a Starbucks franchise in the post office, why not let them do it and make some money while we're at it? There are lots of things they can do. This simple amendment expands Mr. Chairman Ice's provision with this, uh, in this respect uh, and, and, and lifts some of the burden that the 2006 legislation 
put on the Postal Service. We got to remember we are part of the problem. We are part of the crowd that actually put expectations and responsibilities on the Postal Service uh, and restricted what they can do. And so my amendment would say let's lift those, some of those restrictions to give them the opportunity to see what might work and what might not, let a thousand flowers bloom, and two things that protect us from any concerns we might have. The first is it requires, before they do that, an advisory opinion from the uh, Postal Regulatory Commission, making sure that uh, this would be efficacious and wouldn't do any harm. And secondly, if you look at the uh, third page of the amendment, uh, we have a sense of Congress that no, that non-postal services offered by the Postal Service must be carried out, should be carried out in partnership with and not in competition with entities or other persons in the private sector. Uh, that isn't the intent here. The intent is to partner. And so, Mr. Chairman, um, that's my amendment, and I would hope it would find broad and unanimous support um, as we try to fashion a new model for the future. Chairman? Mr. Chaffetz. I move to strike the last word. I, uh, I, based on what I am reading, and I am just reading it for the first time, I would be in opposition to this bill to suggest that, um, that there, you, you said repeatedly uh, there wouldn't be competition, yet one of the examples would be selling coffee. I, I can't imagine, I believe you said that. Well, would, would, would my colleague yield? Sir? The example I gave was if Starbucks wants to locate in a postal office to sell its coffee, why wouldn't we let them? Not that the Postal Service would make and sell coffee on its own. I thank, I thank the gentleman for the I, clarification. I, I guess my, my personal position is, I, as I said earlier in, in one of the other amendments that we were discussing, I think there is room for cross-functionality that are uniquely um, governmental functions. Uh, one of the better examples that I see out there is the offering of passports. Uh, you, now you know where to go to get your passport. You can go to the go to the post, uh, the post office to, to get that service done. Um, I do think we uh, run afoul and create unintended consequences when those services would compete, whether it be a contract um, with a Starbucks to offer coffee. I, I, just, I think that that would create uh, a set of circumstances that would not be palatable to, uh, to what we should be doing with the Postal Service. I just don't. I do believe that there are some cross-functionality with local governments, like driver's licenses and other types of things, particularly in rural areas. I look at the rural postal services or post offices and think some of our communities don't need driver's license, you know, a place to get your driver's license five days a week, and maybe the state should be contracting so that they can, on Fridays or Tuesdays, uh, do those types of services. But I really do worry um, that offering uh, products and services that would be in direct competition with others in that very local community would create some unintended consequences. And yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Lynch is recognized. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I support, I, I think I understand uh, uh, the gentleman from Virginia's amendment. What he's saying is uh, look, let's just take. For example, the Postal Service right now has, you know, thousands of leases for, for, you know, millions of square feet of office space throughout this country. And we are at a point where we, we, we don't need it all. We're going to do some closings here and consolidations. What the gentleman, I think, is suggesting is that uh, right now we, we have shackles on the post office. We don't let them sublet any of their property or or release, uh, uh, sublease, I guess, uh, any of their property to others, even though they may have a very low lease for 30 years and could make a huge profit on that, we don't allow them to do that. So what I think the gentleman from Virginia is suggesting is to use those resources to allow the Postal Service to, to sublet to, to increase the income. There, there is a little bit of this going on, but not not at the level at which uh, we need to do it. Will, will the gentleman yield for a moment? Of course, yeah. A, a question. Conversely, would you support the Postal Service contracting and expanding into more retail outlets? So if a, uh, one of the big box retailers wanted to offer the Postal Services, and, and obviously this is being done now, but if there was a concerted effort on the Postal Service to um, move away from the fixed structures that are Postal Service and simply open up their operations in more Walmarts and Targets and those, you know, Best Buys and those types. Of, is that something that uh, you're also supportive of? Uh, 
If I could answer my colleague, my bill absolutely precisely allows that, yes. Not only am I supportive of it, the bill allows it. That is why, Mr. Chairman, I am absolutely certain upon reflection we will have unanimous support on your side of the aisle for this simple but thoughtful amendment. Thank you. Um, and I will recognize myself to strike the last word. Well, I have to give a lot of credit to my colleague from Virginia for his entrepreneurial thinking and innovativeness out of the box. I must restrict my thinking to, of course, that this is the Postal Service and now putting them at a competitive advantage uh, in areas in which they are not accustomed to uh, in this broad language is not really I think a good idea. I think that the business of business should be left up to business. And while the Post Office has a defined market, 150 million houses, households a day, provide a great service, um, uh, I think giving this broad authority for them to enter into non-postal transactions, retail outlets, uh, using their technology processing facilities could have some unintended consequences that may be counterproductive and actually give an unfair competitive advantage to, I think, business um, uh, functions that the Post Office should not be engaged in. And, and, and I would uh, recommend uh, the defeat of the amendment. Mr. Chairman, would you allow a response? Oh, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, you know, I respect your point of view, but I think that I think you've actually uh, really given voice to precisely the philosophy here in Congress that has gotten the Postal Service into trouble. You can go all over Europe. You can go to many other parts of the world where this is not a novel thought. The idea that if what if a private entity. I'll use Starbucks as an example, says, you know, the Postal Service is so centrally located, we want to put a facility in there. And the bank says, like it does with grocery stores, we would like to put an ATM machine there to make things more convenient for our customers, just another commercial outlet, and we will pay the Postal Service rent in order to do that, a source of revenue. That doesn't compete with the private sector. That is the private sector actually saying this is a location we find desirable. To constrict the ability of the Postal Service not to be able to do that, to deny them possible revenue, is frankly turning our back on the business model of the 21st century and I think very harmful to what we say we want to do, which is to put them back on their feet and put them in a new direction. So I would hope we will adopt the amendment. I thank the Chair's indulgence. The distinguished lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, you are recognized. Well, frankly, I'm, first of all, I apologize that, that I could not be here during most of the day. It's a very important committee meeting, and I w there was no way I could be here uh, or, or, or I would have been. I, I was a little surprised, Mr. Chairman, uh, to, to, to see that you were not sympathetic to this business oriented innovation that my my colleague has uh, has uh, brought up. In fact, I was going to, I, I myself had an amendment along uh, those um, lines. Uh, far from being anti-competitive with uh, some um, retail being able to do it and others not, that could be made a competition. Instead of designating a particular retail, they would then have to compete for the post office business, that would make it fully, uh, fully uh, in concert with the way we do business in the Congress and the way uh, the private sector does business itself. So I think it is a, a very salutary amendment. And if the and if the point is to uh, uh, is 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 to provide some services like stamps uh, to people who would otherwise not have them, I can't imagine why this wouldn't be the thing to do. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Uh, I have some comments, and I just want to ask you something. Mr. Chairman, I just out of curiosity, am I recognized? Yes, sir. You're, are you against this amendment, Mr. Chairman? I, I'm sorry, I was in a, another yeah, hearing. Yeah, yes, sir, I am. Uh, I, want, I want to yield to the Chairman so you can explain to me why you're against this amendment. I mean, I'm just curious. I just oh, I'd be glad to, yes. Sure. In fact, I, I, as I yeah, I'm sure you did earlier. I just want to be clear. I want the 
all your constituents in the world to know why. Go yes, ahead. sir. I, I, without a doubt, I believe that business should be relegated to business. And when we give a broad language, as is done in this amendment, to put the post office in an uncompar unfair competitive advantages to, to the business community, I think that is inappropriate. I think that the Postal Service ought to use its existing resources for its intended purposes, and that is for delivering post office packages, stamps, and the services that it has been well known for and respected for over the years. I think the language here is clearly overly broad. Um, to, to the extent that it says, may establish a program to provide non-postal services that use the processing, transportation, delivery, retail network, technology, or other resources of the Postal Service. Are we going to open up a gas station because the Post Office has fill, uh, uh, fueling uh, facilities there? Are we going to sell gas cheaper because they don't pay taxes on it? I mean, that is the interpretation that I can gather from this. And so, therefore, I think that this is an inappropriate amendment. While I laud the sponsor's entrepreneurial and innovative ideas in this regard, and I think those can be carried on as we progress in the deliberation of this bill as it uh, goes through the committee. Well, thank you very much. I, 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 first of all, I want to uh, thank you very much for your compassion. And um, as I listen to you more and more, I realize that, um, you know, I, every time I speak to a high school group or a college group um, at graduations, and I speak at a lot of them, I always tell them, don't mistake a comma for a period. Don't mistake a comma for a period. I was out at NIH, and what I mean by that is so often we think that we have come up with the answers to solution, with solutions to problems, or we think that this is all we can do, and then we stop there. I was at NIH the other day just talking to some doctors, and they were telling me, Mr. Chairman, that there were some cancers that a few years ago were considered fatal. And because of innovation, they were now able to call these cancers chronic. In other words, they found gene therapy and whatever to cure them. They did not mistake a comma for a period. Um, we want the post office to thrive. Um, I hear from my Republican friends all the time, um, you know, competition, uh, go out there and, and go the American, all-American way. And so it is not about unfair advantage. It is about trying to make sure that they have an opportunity not only to right-size, but to do things that will enhance their ability to deliver. Chairman Issa was absolutely right. We want them to stay in a position where they can continue to deliver the mail at a reasonable cost. I mean, if you got an Exxon station, for example, it's not about taking over the ability to sell cigarettes and whatever. It's about another, something else that they can do, that Exxon station does. I don't hear anybody complaining about that. At the same time, we have a situation where we've got in your neighborhood and mine, I think somebody testified a little bit earlier that we're going to have what thirty thousand is it thirty thousand of various offices and post offices all over the country, and some of them are going to be lost to our communities. You know what's wrong with say a Target or a Walmart or wherever being able to have within their facility some postal services so the very people who are being served now are not left out in the cold or left out, period. And I just think that, you know, we have to be innovative. We have got to help them help themselves. They have already gone further than most folk would go. The unions have been extremely cooperative. And I think we have got to give them a certain level of flexibility and latitude to allow them to be all that they can be. And so they're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't. When they want to be innovative, we say, you've gone too far. And if they're not innovative enough, they, you say they, they haven't gone far enough. And I just, you know, I'm hoping that all this leads to bipartisanship. Uh, but I certainly am concerned when I hear those kind of arguments. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back.
Thank you. And, and just to take the temperature of the committee, we are probably going to vote here pretty soon on the floor. And I think we have one just one more amendment, and then we will roll. Uh, we we'll have seven votes. So we might be able to get them done so that we can vote and then be done. With that, uh, being nobody else uh, agree, uh, speaking on the amendment, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Connolly. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. A recorded vote has been requested. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I, I understand the desire of the chair to uh, be a loyal soldier, but there are five Democrats who just said aye in a voice vote and four Republicans who said nay. I would ask respectfully the chair how he can, with a straight face, declare the nays have it. Well, it is real easy. I wasn't looking at that. I had to listen. That is why the voice vote. That's, uh, <laughs> And a recorded vote, I assume, is requested, and a recorded vote will be offered uh, uh, by Mr. Connolly. Will be postponed. To I thank the chair shortly. Um, Mr. Lynch, you are recognized for your amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. I think it's number 26. Uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Right, se section 113 of the bill. Thank you. Uh, um, the is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. Uh, this amendment would strike Section 113 entitled More Cost Efficient Postal Service Contracting. Uh, regrettably, Section 113 of the bill seeks to ensure that the United States Postal Service contracts will no longer be subject to Federal prevailing wage requirements. The Federal requirement on prevailing wages helps ensure that fair wages for workers on Federal construction projects are paid. This notion should hold true for work performed on postal related projects as well. My amendment would strike Section 113 on the bill, uh, calling for the repeal of portions of Title 39, Section 410 of the United States Code, which currently requires the United States Postal Service to pay Davis Bacon Act wages to employees of contractors working on postal facilities and requires the Postal Service to pay McNamara. McNamara O'Hara service contract wages to employees of both contractors and subcontractors. Uh, as many as of us are aware, Davis Bacon prevailing wage provisions ensure that Federal contractors performing work on specified construction contracts may not pay their laborers less than their prevailing wage and, rate and rates for fringe benefits for corresponding classes of laborers employed on similar projects in that area. Additionally, the McNamara O'Hara service contract provisions ensure that contractors and subcontractors performing services on covered Federal or District of Columbia service contracts may not pay employees in various classes less than the monetary wage rates and fringe benefits found prevailing in the locality or alternatively the rates contained in a predecessor contractor's collective bargaining agreement. Mr. Chairman, these Federal prevailing wage provisions serve to ensure that employees receive fair wages for their work and provide the basic foundation for a decent standard of living. In addition, these provisions also promote the highest quality standards for construction and service work performed under Federal contract and, as a result, better safeguard uh, government against cost overruns, expensive change orders, and substandard workmanship. Again, given the importance of these prevailing wage provisions to both workers and the Federal Government, my amendment would strike Section 113. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this amendment, and I yield the balance of my time. Does any member wish to speak on the amendment? I will recognize myself to strike the last word. Um, uh, what we are trying to do is reduce the costs. That has been the focus of this entire bill. It is in an effort to try to make sure that we make the, the, the Postal Service solvent, that they live within their means, that the rate payers can sustain the, the, the expenses of the United States Postal Service. Uh, it is estimated by the Inspector General's Office that, that, that this would save $675 million uh, in uh, asking for a market rate as opposed to a prevailing rate under the Davis-Bacon Act. Uh, those areas of the country where the market rate is appropriate, whether it be a prevailing wage or whether it be a lower wage, let the market bear that. 
And that's what this bill allows to do. It gives the Postal Service that flexibility to enter into these contracts at the market rate as, as opposed to the prevailing rate. So therefore, I would uh, urge its, its defeat. Chairman. Mr. Cummings. May I be recognized. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, Ranking Member for his leadership on this matter, and I want to thank him for his amendment. Section 113 of the amendment in the nature of a substitute is yet a, another attempt to lower the wages and benefits of workers to their detriment. I have said a little bit earlier that I am wondering whether we have a compassion deficit here. People still have to buy bread. They have still got to take care of their kids. They have still got to pay their mortgages if they still have a house. They have still got to take care of the things that most people take care of. And then they are also told in the last amendment that the post office can't do very much of innovative things because we are worried about competition. And then so we, I guess what we do is we not only tie their hands behind their back, put shackles around their feet, and then say, you know, best of luck. And then say, by the way, uh, we want to reduce your wages at that. There's, awfully some, there's something awfully wrong with this picture. And I'm begging and I'm hoping that the press picks up on this. I'm serious. Because at some point, we have to have a level of compassion for people in this country. Every day, I mean, we read, Mr. Chairman, about how people, uh, the, rate is, the latest rate of poverty, 46.2 million, million in this country. Rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. We are a better country than that, and we can do better. And so I'm not inclined to support a provision of legislation that would allow contractors to pay their workers substantially less than what other similarly situated workers receive. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I support the gentleman's amendment. I want to thank the gentleman for consistently standing up for workers, consistently standing up for workers. I believe that Mr. Lynch gets up every day trying to figure out and under, first of all, understanding that we have one life to live, this is no dress rehearsal, and this is that life, and trying to make sure that folks live the very best life that they can. And I think this is another effort in that vein. And again, I, can, I uh, applaud him. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Um, we have been called to vote on the floor. Are there any other members who wish to, to speak on behalf of this amendment? Uh, seeing none, then uh, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. Uh, in the opinion of the Chair, the noes have it. Um, a recorded vote has been requested uh, on the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch and will be postponed until uh, uh, pursuant to committee rules. We will go vote now, and then once we finish, we will come back. And uh, there being no more amendments, we will uh, have the roll call votes on all seven. Thank you. We will stand in recess.